Hello everybody. Today it is my second lecture of the module 4. In the module 4, in the first lecture I have covered the axial vibration of bar and then I discussed the natural frequency and mode shapes in axial vibration and uh, discussed how the force vibration problem in general case considering the damping can be formulated. Now in today's uh, lecture I will discuss the torsional vibration of the bar. Actually in all real structures there are vibration in different modes. The principal modes of vibrations are in axial direction whatever I call it actually this axial mode of vibration then may be torsional mode of vibration and then there may be transverse or bending mode of vibration. So three modes are predominant in most of the structural components and uh, machine components. So vibration may take place independently or maybe in a combined fashion. So axial torsion as well as bending. Three are the main modes of vibration. So I have discussed independently the axial vibration. Now I will discuss the torsional vibration and later on we will discuss the other uh, types of vibration. Now you can note it the vibration that I am discussing whether it is torsional or axial vibration that are described independently that means there is no coupling with the other type of vibration but in real structure you will find the combination of modes occur and uh, sometimes you may be required to identify or to isolate the particular mode of vibration. Now torsional modes are very common torsional modes of vibration and you can see the shaft failure occurs due to torsion because in machine component when it is rotating then also the some application of the torsional we are twisting moment in the machine component or in a structure you can see that the member is stressed and the effect of torsion is to produce the shear stress and if the shear stress is extremely high then failure may occur. Here you can see that failure due to torsion in a metallic shaft. Now in earthquake although earthquake motion we are taking for uh, analysis in three primary direction x y z but also due to unsymmetry of the structure there may be a twisting component in the resulting motion. So this gives rise to torsional vibration and you can see that circular shaft elevated water tank if I model it as a shaft circular shaft and elevated water tank the mass of the water that is very huge is placed at the top. So we can imagine that a shaft carrying a concentrated mass or shaft concentrated uh, load at the top. So in that case uh, the vibration that takes place in case of earthquake of magnitude that is uh, causing the disastrous effect which is seen in the Bhuj earthquake and then a paper was published on the various damages that occurred in uh, during the Bhuj earthquake and it is seen that the collapse of circular shaft elevated water tank actually that took place due to torsional motion excessively torsional vibration which actually coincides with one of the resonant frequencies. So therefore the disastrous effect you can see in various uh, elements and components of the structure which may be result of the torsion producing the excessively shear stress. Now today's lecture what we will discuss first we will derive the governing differential equations of torsional vibration by force balance that is by Newton's second law. Then I will discuss or derive the governing differential equations of torsional vibration by Hamilton's principle. 
because two are the main tools for formulating the vibration problem and we have studied in detail the fundamental things of Hamilton principle and the Newton second law and now we will apply to many practical problems. So torsional vibration is one of the examples where the Newton second law and Hamilton principle both can be applied to obtain the differential equation of motion. Now in a continuous system like a shaft which has a distributed properties, distributed mass, distributed um, mass moment of inertia or distributed damping, uh, torsional constant which are which may be constant or which may be also varying along the length of the shaft if the cross section varies. So in that case the governing differential equations may contain the space dependent coefficient. But in case of the shaft where the properties are uniform that means mass is con mass moment of inertia is constant then torsional rigidity is constant we will get the governing differential equation with constant coefficients which is relatively easy to solve. Then after that we will find out the natural frequencies and mode shapes. To obtain the natural frequency and mode shapes are the primary objectives of any analysis that is you can see after finding the natural frequency and mode shapes especially for design purpose if you design the component considering the dynamic load then you have to see that natural frequencies uh, should not coincide with the the driving frequency or exciting frequency in that case resonance may occur so to avoid resonance conditions designers should know what is the natural frequency of the system natural frequencies are also important for structural helm monitoring because the natural frequencies change if the structure develops some damage or crack because of degradation of stiffness the natural frequency decreases as a result one can suspect the damage that has occurred due to reduction of natural frequency. Mode shapes are also important and these two parameters are necessary to study the force vibration response in any continuous system using the model superposition technique. So after obtaining the natural frequencies and mode shapes we will find the equations of motion that was originally derived as a partial differential equation now it will be converted into a ordinary differential equations of second order into generalized coordinate. So this equation now will be converted into time dependent uh, equation and in terms of generalized coordinates say generalized coordinates are dependent on time but there will be no coupling of the motion each equation can be solved independently like a single degree freedom system. So that are the techniques that is adopted to solve the force vibration problem in a continuous system. So this will be discussed in relation to torsional vibration of the shaft. Then I will give an example to determine the natural frequencies of torsional vibration of a shaft carrying a rigid disc at the free end. Let us see how we can derive the equation of motion using the Newton's second law. Now here in the figure you can see the shaft. X is the distance measured from this end and here you can see we can take a small element. Two faces of the cross sections are shown here and this is at a distance dx apart. So let x be the distance which is used to locate this section along the length of the shaft or rod. Now take an infinitesimal element of length dx that is shown here. The angle of twist in any length dx in any length dx due to torque T is given by the very well known relation d theta equal to t dx divided by gj. So therefore 
the torque that is applied at the face of the element is T is equal to Gj del theta by del x. Now one thing you can note, here I have used the partial differential sign. Actually partial differential sign has to be used because theta is now a function of x and t. So in a vibration problem in continuous system, we are dealing with the two coordinates if it is a one dimensional object and coordinates are the x and t. So therefore we get this as a partial differential coefficient gj del theta by del x and g is the shear modulus of the material that is required for torsional vibration or determining the shear stress. So you can know that shear modulus g is related to modulus of elasticity by this relation g equal to e divided by 2 1 plus mu where mu is the Poisson ratio. Poisson ratio of the material okay. and j is the torsional constant j is the torsional constant for circular cross section j is equal to polar moment of inertia. How you can determine the polar moment of inertia if IP is the polar moment of inertia, polar moment of inertia, then it can be determined as Ix plus Iy. So that for circular section J is IP but for other section J is not equal to IP, J has to be determined. Okay. And J is a properties of the section, it depends on the geometry of the uh, section. G is purely material properties and the product Gj is known as torsional rigidity. So Gj is torsional rigidity. Okay. The product Gj is called torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness. Okay. Now here you can see the free body diagram of the, the element, the small element is shown here and you can see here in this phase, the left hand phase, the torque acting is tau xt. On the right hand phase, the increment occurs, therefore the torque in the right hand phase will be T xt plus del t by del x into dx that is found by Taylor series expansion taking only the first term and then we have this uh, externally applied torque that is tau xt distributed in a specified manner maybe uniformly distributed or maybe some other manner it is distributed. So because the element is small the distribution may be taken as uniform. So therefore the torque acting here total torque is tau xt into dx. Okay. Now here in general I have shown that cross section of the shaft is varying. But in most of the cases in practical application we find that cross section is uniform. But non-uniformity of cross section is also there in some applications. Okay. Now the torque at one phase is T and other phase is T plus del T by del X into dx. The angle of twist here at this phase is theta xt, at the other phase the increment is theta xt del theta by del X into dx. So the angle of twist at other end will be theta xt plus del theta by del X into dx. Okay. So this is also shown here. Now if I write the Newton's second law considering the inertia torque. So inertia torque is say if I is the mass moment of inertia per unit length of the shaft. Ix is the mass moment of inertia per unit length that you should note it. mass moment of inertia
per unit length. Okay. And then your this uh, damping, we consider also damping and damping is opposing the motion. So damping force is C prime del theta by del t into dx. Del theta by del t is nothing but velocity. So damping constant into velocity is the damping force and on the small element it is distributed in a uniform manner. So I have multiplied it by dx. Okay. Now if I write the Newton's second law, this is the inertia force plus damping force because these two forces are opposing the motion should be equal to summation of all other force. So let us see all other force is what? Here it is T. So I have written T. Then we have this uh, increment T x T plus del T by del x into dx and it is in the opposite direction. So it is with here in this direction we have written first T plus del T by del x into dx. In the left hand face it is in the opposite direction to the uh, right hand face. So therefore it is minus T. Then your this externally applied torque is written as tau xt into dx. So this is the equation for Newton's second law. Now cancelling some common term because this will be cancelled and then dividing throughout by dx. Divide throughout by dx. dx is not 0, maybe small, so we can divide it and after dividing we get now this equation as this. So we now get this is the equation. Okay. So del t by del x plus tau x t equal to i x into del square theta by del t square plus c prime del theta by del t. Now t we have earlier obtained g j into del theta by del x. So substituting t here, here if we substitute this t here then we will get del by del x g j del theta by del x plus tau x t equal to i x del square theta del t square plus c prime del theta by del t. This is a general equation which considers the variable cross sectional property because g j may be a function of x. So a space dependent coefficient you are getting okay. and also the frog distribution are also considered in this equation. Then mass moment of inertia which is also variable along the length is also included here and therefore damping force it is also a function of x may be variable along the length of the shaft. So this is a general type of equation now we can come to a various simplified cases when we require to find out the specific results. Okay. So this is the derivation that I have discussed using the Newton's second law. Now let us discuss the derivation of the equation of motion of torsional vibration using Hamilton principle. What is this? This is nothing but Hamilton principle, very well known principle. Hamilton's equation you can see. Okay. So according to Hamilton's equation, the time integral that is of variation of the quantity T minus U plus W. T is the kinetic energy, U is the strain energy of the shaft plus W. W is the work done due to non-conservative force field. Now this T minus U sometimes may be known as or it is referred as Lagrangian L. So Lagrangian meaning is T minus U, kinetic energy minus the strain energy stored in this beam and it is integrated in the limit T1, T2 with respect to time and equated to 0. So now to write this equation or to obtain the needful results from this equation, what we require to know? First we have to know the kinetic energy of the shaft 
the kinetic energy T of the shaft is kinetic energy generally half m v square you know m is the mass of the or if it is a uh, rotating element then T is equal to half i theta dot square theta dot is the angular velocity so in that case since it is in the domain of the shaft and your theta is varying along the x so we have to write this in the integral form for the small element i x del theta by del t whole square is the kinetic energy of a element dx for the whole shaft we have to integrate from 0 to l in the domain of the shaft and you can see del theta by del t is nothing but angular velocity angular velocity and uh, this is the kinetic energy strain energy stored in torsion is now given as u is equal to half integration 0 to l g j x del theta by del x whole square into dx del theta by del x is the actually you can see this is the the gradient of the slope so it is squared and then it is multiplied with gjx and then integrated gjx for your information may be a constant or in a variable section shaft it may be a function of x so i is the ix is the mass moment of inertia per unit length per unit length now work done due to non-conservative forces. Non-conservative forces present here are the externally applied tau, tau xt and this theta is the angular deformation or angular rotation. So work done due to torque in this element of length dx is tau xt theta xt into dx. For the whole shaft we now integrated it and you can see that this work done during the work done during the application of the torque and when the work is done there is the force or the torque does not change so therefore we do not get this half term okay so half is needed when half is needed when your this the force is varying and then you can take if average force considering the factor half but in that case this uh, half factor will not be there because the force does not change during the twist okay now here it is the work done due to damping work done damping force work what work damping force will do say damping force will be opposite to the motion so therefore work done is negative so minus c prime del theta by del t into theta xt so into dx this is the work done due to damping force so all the uh, non-conservative forces that are responsible to do some work are listed here and this will be taken in the Hamilton's equation ultimately to find out the equation of motion okay now you can see uh, in this equation if i see this equation very clearly we have three components one is del t dt integration t1 to t2 another component is minus delta u dt integration t1 to t2 t2 and another component is delta w integration t1 to t2 dt so we can write it into three components delta t minus delta u plus delta w dt equal to 0. So then it will be easier to compute this variation and then take the some common terms that is appearing so, okay so that is what is done in the next slide so if t is there t is half integration 0 to l ix 
del theta by del t whole square into dx. So, if I integrate, uh, if first let us take the variation of t, variation of t is delta t 0 to l i x and this 2 will come as a coefficient. So, 2 and half the product will be 1. So, there is no other coefficient i x del theta by del t and this again we take because we are now variation of del theta by del t that have to be taken. But since the differential operator and variation operator can be interchanged. So, I have written here dt. So, this is done. Then the strain energy, strain energy u is half integration 0 to l g j del theta by del x whole square into dx. Its uh, variation delta u equal to 0 to l g j del theta by del x del by del x into delta theta dx. So, similarly that we have done here, here also done in the similar fashion. Okay. Then uh, the variation of the work done due to non-conservative forces delta w equal to 0 to l minus c prime del theta by del t into d del theta plus tau x t into del theta. Okay. So, this is the variation just a straightforward application of this variation, but here because of square term we have to differentiate it and then interchanging the differential operator and variational operator we write this equation. Okay. So, individually we have got delta t, delta u and delta w. Now, we have to integrate time integration of these three quantities and then we can write the Hamilton's equation completely. Okay. So, first let us do the time integration of delta t. So, if I carry out the time integration of delta t, I can take this is the first function and this is the second function. You see these are the product of two functions. So, I can take this as a first function and it is a second function to apply the integration by parts rule. So, here the integration 0 to l i x del theta by del t into del theta that is first function into the integration of the second function. So, del theta and limit is put here t 1 to t 2 minus i x is there and this derivative of the first function del square theta by del theta square and integration of the second function is del theta d x d t. So, this we have got delta t dt this integration we have got. Similarly, we get delta u delta u is this integration t 1 to t 2 and then we have put a second bracket g j del theta by del x into del theta and the limit is put which are nothing but the boundary points 0 and l then minus integration 0 to l del by del x g j del theta by del x and integration of this integration of this becomes del theta and d x and time integration d t is there. Then the time integration of the variation of non-conservative work done delta w is t 1 t 2 0 to l bracket minus c prime del theta by del t into del theta plus tau x t into del theta d x d t. So, we have got three components. Now, we can combine these three component and after combining you will find this is the three component that we have already obtained. equal to 0. In all these cases you will find that the del theta is appearing and del theta is arbitrary and actually del theta is 0 at t 1 is equal to t 2. In also other cases in the domain of the shaft the x varying from 0 to l this is del theta is 
non zero so therefore this del theta can be cancelled in appropriate cases and then we get this equation so two things we have to remember del theta vanishes at t is equal to t1 and t is equal to t2 and also del theta is arbitrary in the domain therefore combining all the three integrals what are the three integrals these are the integrals that we obtained earlier one is this another is this and another is this third one is this so if i combine this we will get in one integral this term will be there then first del t so this will be there as a minus then minus delta w dt so it will be minus minus plus so this will be there then the third one is plus delta w so minus c dash del theta by del t delta theta dx will be there and like that you can collect all the terms with the coefficient del theta and it is integrated so under this condition that if del theta vanishes at t is equal to t1 and t is equal to t2 and del theta is arbitrary that is non zero in the domain that is 0 to l so we ultimately get the differential equation of motion that is del by del x gj del theta by del x plus tau xt equal to ix del square theta by del t square plus c prime x del theta by del t now here you can see we have taken a vibration case where the external force is also present external force plus damping is also there so we have taken in a general case and also we have taken the case where gj is a function of space so in a shaft for example a shaft which is tapering a circular shaft which has taper taper cross section so in that case your the j will be varying because for circular shaft j is nothing but ip and if the d is the diameter of the shaft circular shaft at any section x at any section x this is the section x if i take it then ip will be pi dx to the power 4 divided by 32 you can see that it will be nonlinear function of x so the equation that you are getting the differential equation of motion in case of taper shaft you will get the coefficient is space dependent and maybe nonlinear also then ix is also similar thing that is mass polar moment of inertia so polar moment of inertia is this mass polar moment of inertia you can easily determine when you know the the density of the material and cross sectional area c prime is the damping constant the rotational damping here it is nothing but rotational damping it should not be confused with the linear translational damping okay and another quantity that you are seeing in this three integral that is coming here this give rise to boundary condition okay gj del theta del x into del theta is value is 0 to l this becomes 0 how it is 0 because del theta is arbitrary and it is 0 at x is equal to 0 and l is equal to 0 so therefore we are getting the boundary condition from that equation so this boundary condition this equation suggests that the shaft may be free at one end so this indicates that either either this is zero that means it is what is this this is nothing but the torque so stress is zero if the condition of the edge is free in other cases del theta is equal to zero that means we take the displacement is zero which is the condition of fixed end okay so in the fixed end condition theta is 0 in the free end condition gj del theta by del x equal to 0 
So, this gives rise to classical boundary conditions after applying the Hamilton's rule and in this case of torsional vibration of the shaft, classical boundary conditions may be combinations of fixed free, then free free, these are the conditions fixed free and free free or fixed fixed. So, these are the combination that is possible in the torsional vibration of the shaft in classical boundary condition. Of course, non-classical boundary conditions are also there. One problem I have taken up to discuss the non-classical boundary condition. Now, the objective of the vibration analysis that I have told, one of the main objective is to determine the natural frequencies at mode shape. And to determine the natural frequency in mode shape is known as model analysis. So, model analysis can be done, it is a free vibration analysis, but we have to find the eigenvalues that conforms to the natural frequencies and eigen shapes or mode shapes that is nothing but the eigen function. So, here since it is a free vibration, so we can assume that motion is harmonic. That is possible because all free vibration case the motion is harmonic. So, since the damping is not considered here, we are not taking any phase angle, phase difference. So, we are writing that this is what is mode shape, this is what is mode shape. So, this will be a function of space, this will be a function of space only that is phi x into sin omega t, this is the time function. So, one space function and another time function, the product will give you the twist angle theta. Okay. Now, substituting this here, what we get gj d square phi by dx square, because here if I differentiate it, uh, only the space function will be differentiated, so and therefore the ordinary differential coefficient is used. So, d square phi by dx square plus, how plus is coming? Because on the right hand side, if you differentiate with time, two times, then what happens? it is coming minus i omega square then uh, omega square phi x and sin omega t will remain as it is and uh, after differentiating after differentiating this will come here okay and here also your sin omega t will be there but when we transfer this to left hand side the positive sign will appear and therefore sin theta will be cancelled from both the terms. So, sin theta will be cancelled. So, therefore, we are getting d square phi by dx square plus actually it is i omega square by gj and i omega square by gj is assumed as beta square. So, this is the differential equation to find the natural frequencies and mode shape. The solution of this equation is known to us because we can solve it taking the solution phi s e to the power lambda x. Then substituting here we will get lambda square plus beta square equal to 0. So, this gives rise to your two roots one is lambda 1 plus i beta and another is lambda 2 equal to minus i beta. So, therefore, the solution can be written as the phi is equal to some constant c1 e to the power i beta x plus c2 e to the power minus i beta x. After expanding this or writing this in terms of cosine and sine, we now get this as a sine beta x plus b cos beta x. So, how the sine function and uh, cosine function is coming? Because the roots of the characteristic equations are now complex or imaginary. Due to this, when I write the solution e to the power i beta x or e to the power minus i beta x, we must get the oscillatory terms. So, therefore, we can find out the free vibration is always harmonic vibration. So, this is the solution. Now, let us take a shaft, one shaft we will analyze, then another shaft. 
so let us take a shaft whose one end is fixed and other end is free so take a shaft like that so this is x is equal to 0 this n and this is x is equal to l and it is subjected to some torque oscillation so at the fixed end x is equal to 0 we get the boundary coordination phi is equal to 0 and at x is equal to l we get the stress is 0. So, stress is 0 means gj del theta by del x equal to 0 and then substituting this theta s phi x sin omega t we can write this gj d phi by dx equal to 0 at x is equal to l. So, with these two conditions, we will be now able to get the eigen shapes. So, by applying such conditions, we find that because in that case, if I apply the condition, we find one constant that x is equal to 0, phi is 0. So, we get b is 0. And in another case, we get that when we take the differentiation, we get d phi by dx equal to a beta cos beta x minus it will be minus b beta sin beta x. So, put x is equal to l we get a beta cos beta l minus b beta sin beta l and as per boundary condition this is 0 already b is 0 we have got so this term is 0 so we are getting this condition cos beta l equal to 0 so this is the transcendental equation which has to be solved to find the roots of the equation okay after solving this we get beta n is equal to 2 n minus 1 divided by 2 l into pi where n varies from 1 to 2 up to infinity actually in a continuous system Theoretically, there are infinite number of natural frequencies and infinite number of modes. However, for a practical computation, we take only the finite number of modes and finite number of frequencies. So, natural frequencies, once we get the beta and we know that relation, here we will write beta n and omega n subscript. So, that omega n, the nth natural frequency is now 2 n minus 1 divided by 2 pi root over gj divided by i l square and n varies from 1 to infinity. Now, this is the circular natural frequency and unit is radian per second. If you want to convert this into cycle per second, you can do the conversion that once you know the circular frequency, then you can find this uh, the cycles per second that is the frequency in hertz. Okay the normal modes are also orthogonal because you are seeing that sine functions are appearing. So, normal modes are orthogonal and if the orthogonality is condition is applied with respect to the mass moment of inertia then integration 0 to l i phi i x phi j x phi i x and phi j x are two different modes and is integrated in the domain and equal to Kronecker delta. Delta ij is nothing but Kronecker delta and its meaning is i is equal to j this delta ij equal to 1 and i not equal to j delta ij equal to 0. So, with that condition we get the orthogonality equation and normalized mode because these modes are normalized with respect to mass. So, normalized mode is phi n x equal to root over 2 by i l sin 2 n minus 1 divided by 2 l pi into x. Okay. So, three different modes are plotted for the bar which is fixed at one end and phi at another end and you can see this uh, first mode because this end is free, we have the displacement at the free end. This is the second mode, one nodal point is there. In the third mode, 
two nodal points are there except the support. Okay. Now let us see the discretization of the equation. We take the general equation where the forcing term as well as damping is also present. So take here gj and i are uniform throughout the length of the shaft. We assume this so that we can get without the this assumption also it can be done but for simplicity let us take the gj and i are uniform throughout the length of the shaft and then assume that theta is equal to summation uh, n is equal to 1 to infinity phi n x eta n t. So this is the equation using the mode summation technique. Substituting this in the differential equation of motion and assuming c prime is equal to 2 gamma i i omega i and use gj into d square phi by dx square equal to minus omega square i phi we have already found it then the next step will be multiply both sides by phi k x another mode and then integrate it from 0 to l using orthogonality condition so if we apply these three steps in this equation then ultimately we will get a discretized equation of motion. So from this equation partial differential equation of motion we now arrive at the discretized equation eta i double dot t plus 2 gamma i omega i eta i t because this is the ith mode and omega i square eta i t equal to tau i t where capital tau i t is nothing but your generalized torque. So generalized torque is given by integration 0 to L tau xt into phi x dx. Once we get the eta it, then twist angle theta xt at any instant and at a distance x can be determined with the mode summation method theta xt equal to summation n is equal to 1 to infinity phi n x eta n t. Now here that means summation will go like that like that but there are infinite number of modes however for practical competition we can consider only first few modes. Now let us discuss a problem the natural frequencies of a shaft of uniform cross section fixed at one end and carrying a disc at the free end. Now consider a bar fixed at 0, x is 0 here and carry is a rigid disc of mass moment of inertia id. For circular shaft j is the polar moment of inertia of the cross section and i is the mass polar moment of inertia per unit length. So these are the data given for that we have to find the frequency equation and from this solving the frequency equation we can get the natural frequencies. So this is the equation to determine the natural mode shapes and frequencies where beta square is nothing but omega square i divided by gj. So solution of this equation we have seen earlier is phi x is equal to a sin beta x plus b cos beta x and because we need the derivative also so let us take d phi by dx. So d phi by dx is a beta cos beta x minus b beta sin beta x. Now boundary condition at the fixed end here phi is equal to 0. But at this end the disc is present. So the uh, torque produced by the disc is has to be found out and then it is to be equated to the torque at the free end. So this is what is done here. So gj at x is equal to L where the disc is attached. The inertia torque of the disc is minus id del square theta by del t square and this is the torque at the free end of the bar. But this is not 0 actually because of the presence of this disc. This torque has to be equated to the inertia torque of the disc. So this is the boundary equation that we get at other end. Now in harmonic vibration we already assume theta xt equal to phi x sin omega t. So therefore 
and uh, we get this other end x is equal to 0 so b is equal to 0 so we are only interested in this quantity so this is not to be considered because b is 0 so d phi by dx we have got like that and therefore substituting this here gj and a beta cos beta l equal to omega square id a sin beta l because this when we differentiate sin omega t two times then omega square will come and minus omega square minus sin will give you the positive quantity. So we get ultimately this equation. In this equation many things are common you can see gj gj can be cancelled then beta if I divided beta square we will get here beta and the constant arbitrary constant a can also be cancelled okay so many things are cancelled so therefore simplified equation that we get cos beta l equal to beta id by i sin beta l so this is written in this form because we multiplied this equation by bit l and divide it by l so that means and if i transform cos beta l to the right hand side we have 10 beta l and then if i multiply right hand side by l and divide right hand side by l so we get here denominator i l and the numerator beta l so ultimately our equation is 10 beta l equal to i l by i d into 1 by beta l so this is the characteristic equation for determining beta l so for any value of the ratio of i l by i d you can find out this uh, equation now for con consider consider the id is very large compared to il or id is very small compared to il so in that case we get 10 beta l is very large value so that means if i assume 10 beta l is large value that means infinity then we get beta l that is beta n l is possible only for that value say n pi by 2 where n is equal to 1 3 5 like that so you will get this uh, frequency roots for this special condition but for any other value of ratio of i l by i d we have to determine let us find the natural frequencies of the shaft if i l by i d ratio is 2 so in that case we get that 10 beta l is equal to 2 by beta l so we have uh, here this equation can be solved by different numerical techniques newton raphson method is there or other method bracketing and bisection these methods are there but here we will illustrate this solution with a simple graphical method where you can find the first natural frequency very easily. So let us find the natural frequency of the shaft for this ratio. We take two function f1 beta l equal to 10 beta l and another function f2 beta l equal to 2 by beta l. Left hand side is one function of beta l, right hand side is also one function of beta l so and uh, if we plot the graph of beta l versus f1 or f2 the intersection of these two graphs will give you this the roots of the equation so first intersection take place here which is 1.13 for this i l by i d ratio 2 so here beta 1 l is equal to 1.13 so that means first frequency if I want to determine beta 1 is equal to 1.13 by L. So our equation that omega is equal to beta into gj i L square. Now we can put say here beta 1 is equal to 1 by 1 3 and then gj is given 
for numerical data of the shaft or physical properties of the shaft length will be given mass moment of inertia you can determine so you can calculate the first natural frequency of the shaft so let us summarize today's lecture in this lecture torsional vibration of shaft is discussed equation of motion of the shaft under torsion is derived based on newton's second law and hamilton's principle natural frequencies and mode shapes are determined decoupling procedure for solving the force vibration response with damping has been discussed the natural frequencies of a shaft carrying a disc at one end was discussed thank you very much mm -hmm.